Welcome to CTO Confessions with TC Gill. Brought to you by IT Labs. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This episode of CTO Confessions is brought to you by the one and only IT Labs, providing technology leaders with purpose-driven development teams for high performance and innovation and productivity. And what more could you want? Please think of us like tech leaders, favourite off-the-shelf service providing quality, high-performing teams off that shelf. And your host today is moi, TC Gill, IT Lab's Chief Talking Officer. And I'm speaking to you from sunny UK, where we say sorry far too often. Sorry. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about someone that's been leading in military to leading in tech. We will now invite our guest to join us from Washington, D.C., USA, Charles. Welcome, Charles. So welcome to the podcast, Chuck. It's great to have you on. Hey, good evening and good afternoon, depending on when you're, when you're listening to this. Possibly. Yeah, that's right. Good morning. Yes. And, and, and for you, I, I guess it's uh, morning. What, what part of the US are you in, sir? I am on uh, the, I guess, the eastern seaboard. So I'm uh, outside of the Washington, D.C. area. So eastern United States. It's great to have you. And so in terms of the work that you do, um, Chuck, you know, you, uh, you know, looking at your profile and your kind of history, um, you know, you come from the military. I mean, how did you end up becoming a, a CTO? What was that journey like? <laughs> it, it, uh, you could argue what a long, strange trip it's been. Uh, <laughs> but the Grateful Dead comment aside, I, I, let's, let's, let's sort of walk from, let's start from where I am today. Cool. I am the uh, chief technology officer of Fornetics. I helped find the com- I was one of the founders of the company. I helped invent the technology, you know, and, and really part of the team that would bring that together. Uh, and that, and my, my day, day roles, A, how do I project a technical vision on what we're doing? And, you know, how do I, you know, how to, how do I, uh, you know, how do we align that with what we're doing from a roadmap perspective? How does that transition into working with the engineering team to turn that into a reality? Uh, how do I support, you know, how do I work with the sales team so we can sell it? How do we put marketing so we can position it? Right. And so it's a role that ends up having a very cross-functional impact across the organization. So I'm sort of a, you know, in, in, you know, in, in some cases, my role is to support everybody else to be sort of the voice of the technology, the vision of the technology. But ultimately, you know, you know, the, the company makes up my, you know, I, I am nothing without the company. I'm just some, some person spouting off ideas. It's the company that gives this, that, that gives the vision substance. Right. And so that's part of that job there. Now, how did I get there? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to go back. Uh, back when I was in school or university, depending on what part of the world you're hearing this in. Uh, and I joined, uh, when, I went to, when I went to school, I, I had no intention of using a degree. I was like, well, that makes no sense. But I had to go through school. I had to, be, I had to get a degree to become a commissioned officer in the Army. Wow. And since the Army was paying for my school, uh, I decided, well, if I'm going to do something. I might as well do something. I, I mean, I might as well make the most of my time here. And I opted to, uh, you know, get a degree in electrical and computer engineering. And at the time, you know, I've always had a, a passion for technology. You know, I could, you know, could give an entire podcast series on things not to do with technology from what I did in my, my when I was, you know, when I was in high school. Yes. Uh, but that's, you know, that, that, that's a subject for a different, that's a, that's a subject for a different podcast. Yeah. I'll just say I had a, a passion for technology. Wow. But I wanted to go off and, you know, actually I ended up becoming, and, you know, I, I branched infantry. So wow. it also apparently had a passion for wanting to go blow things up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so that, you know, but, but even then I was injured uh, in a training accident. They said, well, I can't be infantry anymore. You can be intelligence. Uh, I did intelligence things, some of which with technology. Uh, that would start start pointing me to this ultimately what would have me go into the CTO space. But even then, my drive was how can I use technology to solve problems? How can I do that to make a difference? So it was, the the, the title was never a goal, solving the problem. Solving problems has always been the goal. Keep that in it. 
uh, I would be injured in the Iraq war and told that I, you know, I had to, you know, I, I would have to leave uh, the military. Uh, spent three and a half years in the government security arena and uh, learned a lot in that role about the technology missions, really started getting deeper into what would be the security side of things. Right. Uh, and would use that time to transition from military to civilian to, and, you know, to eventually even transition out of that program after about three and a half years to help with a startup called Anacam that did multi-factor authentication. But then I wasn't a CTO. I was like a director of delivery engineering. So a lot of my role was, is no matter what the CTO of the company convinced a customer that we had, my job was to make sure that we would deliver whatever it was. Right. Okay. Whether it was, what was on our product list or it was rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that would, that would put something in me about you know, that would impact later the idea of selling what you have or, you know, you, you, you know, or selling how, or, 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 or cast what you have in light of what, you know, the problems are. And then we'll, we'll get more to that later conversation wise. Yeah. Uh, and you know, that would, and then eventually would end up in a situation where I went in with a few other gentlemen, we'd start our own company. And the investors looked at me and asked if we were a product company. And at the time I said, at this point, I did take on the, the mantle of CTO. And I told him, I said, the gentleman's name is Doug. He's still our executive chairman today at Fornetics. I said, Doug, cool. uh, you know, we're not a product company, but if we find something, we're, find something worth building into a product, absolutely will do so for you. And that would sort of set the stage, you know, where we did a project for the Air Force, uh, U.S. Air Force uh, demonstrated what would happen if you could orchestrate the use of, you know, uh, of key management with a broader communication system and took something that was supposed to be a 48-hour exercise and demonstrated in a lab environment that it could be reduced to 23 minutes. Wow. Okay. And that's when I went back and I said, Doug, we built a product. And that, 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 and the rest of it would just be the, you know, the, 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 the slings and arrows of, you know, taking an idea, productizing it and, you know, lots of lessons learned, uh, arguably a lot of them from the way of pain, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, that, that, but that would lead us to, you know, the conversation, you know, TC, you and I are having today. Excellent. That's, that's great. I mean, that is a journey. Um, I'm mean, kind of curious is in terms of the transition from, actually being in the military you kind of described that program um of of then transitioning i guess what you would call civvy life you know um, exactly yeah. uh, what was that like it, it, you know was that quite painful or, or... so what's truly an awesome thing and a blessing is it's so much better today than it was back in 2004 2005 uh for us who were injured during the original iraq war it was sort of you know, okay, uh, you're injured. Uh, good luck with life. Adios. Right. And so they're really, now I was very fortunate. Uh, I'll give a story. So I interned at a U.S. Coast Guard facility uh, between my uh, sophomore and junior years of uh, college. And I, and I, and I made a, a, you know, a, a good name for myself. I was, I was a proficient software engineer, even in college, I suppose. Uh, and so I went back there to say, Hey, I'm leaving the service. And, uh, I, I, I think I need to look for a job. And so they said, Hey, come by, we'll talk. And I'm in like an Aloha shirt, you no know, Hawaiian shirt, <laughs> a pair of jeans. And, I get wa I'm walked into this room and there's a whole bunch of people in suits and ties. Right. And I would find out later that the, when we said when we talk is I want you to interview to be a division program manager. Right. No, that didn't. So I, I realized at that point that I, I, I had, this is not quite what I was expecting. So I, I probably came off as someone who just fell off of a turnip truck. But I explained a vision for technical leadership, how I would go about solving problems. And so that wasn't the right fit. 
obviously. Now, maybe it could have been, but I don't think, even if it were, I don't think it would set me on the right path. So I would have a follow-up conversation. The guy said, you're obviously smart and you've got a very interesting background because, you know, I was a computer engineer and I was, you know, an intelligence officer. Uh, I ended up somewhere else. Right. Now, I, for the sake of, we'll just say that somewhere else was very interesting and it's really cool things, none of which I can discuss. I'll be, we'll both be dead by the time I could actually discuss what those things were. So we'll just say it was very cool. It did a lot to change me and would be beneficial because it was a, into itself, a good transition program from military to civilian. Right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and it gave me an outlet. I would work 17 hour days uh and still feel like i was i think that was the biggest thing i needed at the time was i needed to know that i was still solving problems i was still yeah. impacting mission you know because i didn't i didn't leave the military willingly you know i was told i was too injured to stay in the service so this is a way for me to you know continue continue the fight so to speak yes yeah and i put out you know a lot of time and energy into it and it was successful yeah. so by the time i did about three and a half years I, I, I needed to, I think that was about a tour of duty for anybody in that program. Uh, I looked at doing something else and the opportunity to get into a startup software company presented itself. And so I, I made a very interesting jump transition wise, yeah. uh, you know, from, you know, some dark spooky place to, uh, you know, the wide open commercial software company. Yes. And, and in terms of, um, uh, you, you know, what you learn in the military and then applying that to the civvy world, um, obviously, yeah, um, what I love about your story, um, Chuck, is um, your desire to solve problems. And this is what businesses, if they're getting it right, are doing, you know. So in terms of the, the kind of leadership, did you find your time in the military gave you great leadership skills to be able to kind of help uh, these companies, uh, this company uh, achieve its goals and produce products? I, I think so. If anything, at a minimum, it arms you with perspective. Uh, I, you know, there are some drawbacks too. I mean, that the, there is a, uh, I was very fortunate that why it was a very important part of my job. I had to, you know, I, I always told my soldiers that I will explain, please note that, you know, why we're doing something is a luxury. I don't have to do that, but I recognize we all know the value of doing it, but there might be a day someday where I, I have to give you an order and I don't, I, I don't have the benefit of giving you the why. Yes. Uh, in business, the why is essential. You have to understand why you're cause, because there's efficiencies there. Yeah. No one, you know, no, you know, it's like, a, a being invested in being successful, not necessarily in always being right. Uh, notes that you need the why is important so people can give you better alternative ideas. Yeah. Uh, and when building teams, I always found that, you know, why let you gravitate? You know, why why was a chance to explain why, to understand? It, it drives, it helps create inclusiveness in organizations. Uh, when the why is not explained, it creates barriers. Right. And so as a goal, as a way to look at how do you build teams that can survive thick and thin was always that desire to, to be able to provide guidance and, you know, then to the best of your ability, explain the why. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, that's, that's a great perspective. You know, it's, it's, and you know, as I look at the various, and, and, and then I would say there's always, there's, there's another leadership tenet was, you know, the ne you know, it, as an officer, I would never make my soldiers, my non-commissioned officers do anything that I wasn't prepared to do myself. Yeah. And bringing that mentality in that if there was an all night event where something happened, they wouldn't be there alone. I would be there by their side. You know, you, you, you carry the burdens with your brothers and sisters to, to, to accomplish something. Yes. Uh, the, now I'll put a caveat there that one of my own things I've worked on, and I think I've improved on over the years 
is that as a manager, I would, that, that being there also gives you the temptation of helicoptering, you know, being a heli, you know, hovering over them, uh, you know, trying to get a response. I think I, I, over the years, I, 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 I realized that didn't really help anything. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a lesson learned. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and in turn though, you can listen and sometimes just people need someone to talk to as they're trying to solve a problem. Uh, because in, in, in talking the problem out, they find an answer. Yes. Uh, the, and you know, when I look at this, that, that, that idea of, you know, but then, but the, there's a, there's a degree though, that it, one of the things is, you know, we were I was remember being taught as a cadet, you know, there are like three types of leadership. There is this idea of directive leadership, you know, which is, we, we, we say in technology is, uh, you know, is the effective effectively is uh, shut up in color. Right. You know, that, that, that's, uh, there is the idea of, you know, delegating, uh, you know, a, you know, delegating authority, delegating leadership, where I just tell you to go do it and you go figure out, you go figure it out. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a, the, this other one, which is I think the one I've always gravitated to, is participatory. So uh, participatory leadership, which is you take inputs, you you let the team participate in the process, but ultimately the decision lies with you. Yeah. And I, I, I you know I will say that I've learned some of the benefits of delegating with the when you build a, a high performing team, you learn to do that as well. Uh, but the thing is you can delegate authority, but you can't delegate responsibility. Yes. That's a really good point there. Yeah. And this has, whether this is technology or, you know, this is running a construction company or this is for, you know, any sort of service industry, that problem doesn't go away. That's, that's part of the human condition. It just happens to be that my universe is right now is technology. So there we have it. Mm. And in a technical sense, that means, you know, when you say something has got to be built, uh, you know, you directive would say, I'm going to tell you exactly how to code this. And this is exactly the specification you have to do. And that, 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 that's, that doesn't work because a, it's that if you're building sufficiently large systems, complex systems, uh, you're going to get in your own way faster than you can say, get in your own way. <laughs> uh, participatory works to a degree and it's much more so in the design side, but when it finally gets down to it though, when it comes to when you're going to code things, develop things, you have to delegate that to the developers, the quality assurance professionals, the people who actually build the product. Right. And that's a, because you, there, there, there's so many, you know, if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're a hindrance to operations. Yeah. And the, you know, Participatory works well in design. Delegation is critical once you finally are you're getting somewhere. If you can't delegate that 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 authority to get the work done, you 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 know you're you're a micromanager or you you know you're you're not actually helping solve any particular issues. So I mean, I, I look at it like uh, that 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 becomes a critical part of recognizing this and, and looking to see where, you know, where, you know, in my own story where maybe I, I, I should have delegated sooner or i um, man, I should not have, you know, or maybe I should have stepped in you know, the, the inverse as well, man, I should have stepped in and taken more control of that because the end result was not what we were expecting. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, that, and, 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 and when it turns into that, it, you know, it's always, it's not the individual, you know, it's the leader's fault, you know, because of, you know, because of people, you know, you can't, you know, that, that that's part of the, that, 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 that goes back to that responsibility piece. You have to take ownership of those actions and realize, yeah, that, that, you know, that, that, that was not what we were expecting. Right. Uh, but you know, that is that, that's where we're at and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, let's, let's, and it's, and, you know, and, 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 and fight the temptation to try to figure out why it happened in the short term. Get back to that once you solve the problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite interesting the the uh, perspective you have on leadership here. That uh, uh, precipitary 
uh, leadership. I don't know if I said that right, but tongue's getting twisted there. Um, and then kind of moving over to kind of de the delegative um, uh, style of leadership. I mean, is that something that was quite um, evident within the kind of military world as well? Or is this something that you've kind of figured out as you've gone along? Oh, it, the, those uh, directive, participatory and uh, delegating, that, that, that's, that was, that's doctrine. That's how we were trained to look at leadership as, wow. from a, as a cadet perspective. It just happens to be that, you know, that was a good understanding what those techniques are and when you use them and when not to use them. Right. Or looking back and saying, man, I should have used something different. It, 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 it's it is a it, it's all part of that 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 tapestry of events that makes up you know who you work with how you how you impact things and ultimately what little role i played in you know the you know the the the, the, the story of all those events yes yeah that's that's fascinating that's great and um kind of coming back to uh, the kind of high performing teams um and, and you know, uh, as a as a tech leader, creating that vision as to where we're trying to go. Because from my own personal experience, I've seen this done really well, and um, and and in other places could have been done better. Um, how do you kind of align people to a vision? You know, as to what you're trying to do, that kind of end goal, the outcome. And this is you know, for us, the the, the education on the vision starts with making sure that you know. The, the, the other leaders in your organization understand that vision. And those you can impact, you make sure they absolutely understand where things are going. Because at least it's that, because the idea is that vision is, it's, 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 it's that target on the far horizon. Yeah. And how you get about going there is not always a straight path. Yeah. And it's the perspectives of others who are looking at that vision and their insights that what the vision ultimately becomes is a way to say, here's my left, here's my left limit, here's my right limit. Everything between those limits is in the vision. And how we, how we get between those two limits is driven by, in many cases, factors outside of your control. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we see, and uh, and in terms of kind of delivering that um, that vision to the teams, I mean, um, you know, you, uh, do you, what kind of tools do you use to kind of make sure people see that? Is it just repeat uh, again and again, or is it do you going to use some visual uh, tools to to help? Lots of presentations. I wish that there was some magic tool to go do it elsewise. <laughs> I was hoping you would say something. Yeah, uh, yeah. But 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 you have to keep things, you know. As you know, and, the, and the trick is to try to do it. I would say this thing I, I'm still learning is how to present that vision in different ways, and how do I continue to simplify the vision, simplify the messaging, mm. so that people understand it and they can act on it. Because you're always find you're cycling through people, or you know, it, or their understanding changes, or you know, elucidation via, you know, aggregation, the more, the, the more, you know, the more I know, or the more, you know, the more I'll tell you, uh, yeah. you know, it, 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 finding that right fit is, you know, I think it, and it's still something I'm working on even to this day. How do I, how do I, how do I educate people on the vision of the company? How do I explain where we're going? Uh, how things fit in. What are why? Why are you here? What's the importance of this role? What are we trying to get you to accomplish? Yeah. And the I'm I'm actually internally I've got a working team with my uh, uh, my uh, it was a VP of product management and my uh, you know SVP of uh, mark global marketing and the three of us sit down and we're working on that sort of as a working group because I have ideas I have concepts I got that vision. But having the gentleman who ultimately manages product look at it, and having the the the, 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 the lady, the brilliant the, the brilliant woman to look at it and say, "Well, this is what it means from a marketing perspective," that helps, you know, a answer a lot of those why, explain the why, and you know, get feedback on you know why those things are important. So you know, the thing is, a vision is always something. It, 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 it needs, it, it just can't be something written in stone. It needs a consistent look at, check, feel, touch, 
right. so that you can make the best of it. And while at the same time, realize like the goals, the things you you have, your product roadmap, your, you know, your, where the little decisions you're making today, how that might impact the vision a year now, or two years or three years from now. Right. And so that you can, you know, and you know, or how how the vision should impact you know other things with terms of like maybe you know who you partner with who you have act to have acquisition discussions with all of that sort of plays in because if you're not thinking about that then you could be your the decisions you make could ultimately hamper where you're trying to go right. you know you're, you're stopping progress yeah okay, excellent that's great so um i'd like to kind of come into the kind of tech aspect of your role you know um uh, so obviously you're in the kind of security space encryption and what have you um uh how do you find kind of leading I, i'm going to share a, a, a honest feeling around security and technology as, as particularly security is that it's quite a scary thing in this kind of day and age you know uh, there's lots of abilities of getting it wrong and then it has huge repercussions for organizations and how do you find leading that to making sure that, you know, ultimately you're responsible for making, making things work and, uh, and being secure? So that's a great question. And you know, that perhaps some of that is being, you know, sort of in that environment for so long, uh, whether it was, you know, overall systems architecture and security or, interacting with identity services and security, or now this idea of cryptographic systems, key management and security is, you know, it, you find yourself, you remind yourself something that with all of that, there's still a reason why you're there. No one goes to work to use key management, right? They use key management. They use crypto systems. They use encryption to go to work. It is that, that realization that when you're in the space, that the technology in any security technology really falls under this. I mean, there, there, there is a business purpose. There's a business reason why, why your technology is important, but it's, you know, it's not the technology into itself. Right. So understanding that and addressing that is a critical part of you know, understanding the space you're in within the security so that you, one is that, what, well, why am I here? And then there's other things. Uh, there, there, there is the regulatory environment. So, you know, your certifications you have to have because it's a security technology. Uh, encryption's interesting because there's a political aspect to it. Yes, that's good. Point. Uh, it, it, as security technologies go, you know, it's, it is, it has been political longer than most. <laughs> uh, now, I mean, there's there's a whole types of thought into artificial intelligence and machine learning and other things like that, that they have their own politics as well as in that now as well. But you, you you look at that, and you know the you you find yourself realizing that you have, which can create its own its own challenges. If someone says, "Well, I want you to." change the nature of your product so it's in line with this this market trend we're seeing over here yeah and it was a man if i was building an app that was some sort of web or database thing i could do that in like a month hmm. unfortunately i have to have something that's got a defined crypto boundary that goes through certification uh oh by the way and you know a customer has an expectation of all of these things as much as i would like to pursue that uh I have to find another, we have to find another way to scratch that itch. Yes. And some, and, and that becomes, that can even be, that can be a difficult, you know, conversation yeah. because you, you know, security and, and the thing is that security itself, the policies that drive that are, it's, it, it, it's not, it, it's squishy. It's the human component of things. Yeah. So it's not, it might not even always make sense. So yeah. you, you have that, you know, coming as so it, it does, it does, create a degree of complexity and you know you find yourself asking the why question for different reasons like why am i doing this but you yeah. know I, I kid but i mean it's like uh 
you know, you, 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 you know, it's, it, it, it's, but then it switches to why do we need to do this? And that conversation gets into, okay, there are things that we can apply, but let's, let's, uh, let's find a way to, you know, push that forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, I'm kind of curious around once you've kind of create your, your products, you know, you're kind of leading this, uh, creating these kind of security products and what have you, um, in terms of making sure that they're kind of watertight, the testing, I, I, um, how the hell do you start testing something like that? I am a huge, huge fan of concepts like continuous integration. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, I to, for our QA team, to their credit, they do, you know, it's not just the, the, the functional or, or even non-functional testing that they do manually. They then take steps immediately to automate. Yeah. And so the fact that you, you our, our, our technology goes through a set of, you know, not, you know, not a, a, a functional regression tests, et cetera, to demonstrate, and this is, this happens nightly. Uh, that any code change being put in still meets those that that, that that test infrastructure. Yeah. And you know, and you still you also have to submit to outside you know validations as well because once again it's a security technology. So there's a number of things that play into all of that. That ultimately you know because when when someone buys a product like this, they're not just buying the you know what the product does they're buying they're buying the providence of that technology where it comes from and the process in which it was delivered right so that that that's a critical thing to consider that's why but testing whether it's internal or it's independent is things to consider when delivering a security product yeah and and so in terms of the independent testing is that something that uh, your customers and clients kind of engage in or is that is that kind of a norm? I would say it's kind of a norm. Right. You know, like things like, uh, you know, getting uh, a FIPS, you know, or one of our products was recent, recently uh, received its FIPS 140-2 uh, level two certification. It had to go through an outside lab as part of that certification process. Right. Okay. And, and, and you kind of mentioned that there's a lot of kind of regulation and uh, compliance and what have you. Do you find that's kind of a hindrance to your kind of innovation and the ability to kind of create products or would you say it helps? Ask me on certain times of the week. <laughs> uh, in one sense, I, I see where it helps because it, it lets you, it helps you draw a box around the problem, yeah. you know, so you can understand the scope of what the challenge is in the, on the other side, some of the regulation actually stymies innovation so that you, you know, you're, you're limited to what that process is to be able to actually go off and do something. Right. Yeah. I imagine that's quite, I can, I, I'm just getting a feeling for how frustrating that can be at times. Cause, um, I, I imagine it's a little bit like trying to, uh, uh, crawl through treacle, you know, kind of thing. Um, but, uh, so, so, so in terms of the kind of technology that you're working on, um, I, 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 I appreciate the fact that you might not be able to tell us too much here, but you know, what's the kind of next generation in, in security and encryption that you, that you see or foresee out there? Uh, so great question. Uh, so I look at, I'm looking at a few different areas right now, a big focus in addressing that hybrid space between information technology and operational technologies. Right. And that, that, for our technology area is a, is a vastly underserved con, uh, con, uh, constituency constituency. Uh, so getting into whether it's, you know, I will, everything from smart meters, IOT devices, uh, you know, smart automation, uh, you know, factory floor X, there's, there's a universe there where I'm putting a lot of energy into where we go into that space. Because we've always kind of looked at it, you know, if you look at the rise of IoT and the rise of Fornetics, the two kind of go hand in hand. Right. Okay. On, and then, of course, looming on a general side is what are some more applications? How do, how do we, how does crypto, how does con command and control of cryptography play in the world like where you have application delivery via container? 
or you know the, the the big the big bugaboo in the industry as a general is what happens when uh it's decided that asymmetric cryptography things like rsa or elliptical curve diffie hellman uh are you know elliptical curve digital signature algorithms are no longer considered appropriate and you should be going over to uh, like a dilithium or a kyber or a bike or whatever these post quantum algorithms how do you transition that what's that look like right uh and then you know furthering from a practical perspective you know the way that our technology deploys it's ultimately like a spider web how do i create more strands how do i create more connection what's that look like which ones do we do first because you could connect everything but you know, that gets into, are you doing the right thing? Are you doing the thing? Are you doing what you think is necessary? Or are you doing what, what's necessary in light of what the customer cares about? There's a big difference there. Right. Yeah. And, and in terms of, um, you know, obviously, uh, you, you know, there's going to be a performance hit in terms of how this security and encryption works. You, do, you, do you find that uh, a big conversation, uh, consistent conversation around performance? Yeah. Um, Earlier on, yes. Now, it's almost so much of a given that the the performance headache has been going away. Ah, oh, good. You know, people <laughs> realize that if I'm going to, particularly as data has, you know, data used to sit inside your perimeter, and if it was well you know and your perimeter is you know, it, it, it's your it's where your ids your ips your firewalls all of this means to protect you know it's where i have my digital rights management all that stuff is sitting there on my perimeter so that i could have things unencrypted on the inside right yeah now where you look at a lot of like cloud hybrid cloud all this this and what's cloud cloud is somebody else's data center all right I mean, it, it, awesome provisioning principles. I'm not, I'm not short and I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to say something trite about cloud, but I use that because when you think about it, it drives use of encryption because encryption is a control. It's fundamental. It's something that a computer actually understands your password. Well, you have to write instructions to, uh, you know, to, you know, you have to write code to say, interpret this password and do something with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have to write code for everything, but the point of the matter is, is that there's actually encryption instruction sets on CPUs. Right. That's, hey, that, down in the hardware. Exactly. Like AES-NI with an Intel chipset. Uh, and so that, that fundamental nature notes that as data transitions, you know, where the boundary as we know it goes away and everything is looking at into a data centric sort of security model people have come to realize that encryption is it, it, it's 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 a necessary performance hit. You you could make the argument it's a lot like seat belts. Right. You know, a seat belt slows down the, the time it takes to me to get into a car and start it and drive it off, but I would never think about not putting one on at this stage. Yeah. That's a great analogy actually. I so uh, there's a real penny drop uh, in my mind when you kind of uh, describe that. Um but uh, in, in terms of uh, a lot of this uh, functionality ending up on chip, um, um, so uh, in terms of that, that encryption and security technology, is it, I mean, does it always end up uh, it being kind of integrated into uh, silicon or is it, uh, does it kind of sit no. in the software space for a while? So some of the most interesting things we're doing as a company are supporting what happens when it does make it to silicon. And that's particularly on the embedded and IoT side. Uh, we're doing some pretty neat work with a, a, a small semiconductor company. You might have heard of them. They're called Micron. Okay, they're not small. They're like a like fourth largest on the planet, second largest in the United States. Right. Uh, and it's around integrity uh, for you know you know for instructions for firmware at the silicon level, but. I could go on, we could talk about that all day, but I don't think that's what the, the, the <laughs> Maybe podcast you can do a presentation is. one day on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let, 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 but no, when it comes down to it, it's software, it's firmware. A lot of what we do is support, particularly on the IT side, a lot of technology already uses encryption. 
There's yeah. just nothing there coordinating or orchestrating its use. And that, you know, whether you're dealing with things like GDPR or, you know, the you know, CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act, New York Shield, even some old school things like uh, HIPAA, right? Yeah, yeah. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Say that five times backwards. <laughs> uh, the, the fact is that in all of those things, you know, you have a lot of technologies that use encryption, but then inevitably they say, well, how, how am I getting the keys that use that encryption in place? How am I keeping track of that? Where's my governance? Where's my control? And that's that, 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 that drives the need. So a lot of times, maybe it's, it goes back to a matter of perspective because we are so married to the use of encryption. Uh, we're in the convert by the time if we're in the conversation, I can only count maybe on a couple of fingers when encryption wasn't a, a, a sort of a foregone conclusion. And even in those conversations, ultimately it was too. It's like, uh, well, you really don't have a choice given what you're trying to get done here. Uh, and you, you walk them through the mechanics, whatever their problem is. Mm. Yeah. And, and um, so, you know, keeping on the subject of kind of performance uh, of, of the, of the encryption and the security systems, uh, um, we, we started a conversation earlier before the podcast around attribute driven architecture. Do you want to describe um, what that is and, and how that helps, um, you know, in, in, the, in your industry? Sure. And, it first i'll give you know the fact that a nod to the uh, carnegie mellon's uh, software engineering institute because is where the concept comes from and it is this idea of you know attribute driven design attribute driven architecture is acknowledging for any system or system of systems you know or even sub components of systems arguably so even like you know components of code uh that there's not just what the code does which is, is how it functions. There is a whole host of non-functional attributes that represent how it does what it does. The security, the interoperability, modifiability, availability, usability, extent, you know, uh, illities. You know, you talk about people talking about illities. <laughs> the illities. The illities, yeah. yeah. That, 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 and all of that adequately defines, you know, what you know, how you would go about, you know, saying what, you know, whether it's, it's, it's requirements and vignettes or it's stories and acceptance criteria, they, they help you adequately define testable components so that you can say, did I not only do that, did I, did I build the right thing and did I build the right thing correctly? Right. And it's because, you know, but if, because if you can't define what the problem is, really hard to solve a problem you don't understand yeah it's very true yeah what problem are you solving yeah and, and, and that can be that can be defined as you know a, a, and depending on how you look at it what might be a functional aspect of you know fornetics vault core product could easily be a security aspect of the broader system right and, you know, or what might be something for, you know, what something is functional in a component that's like doing data replication between, you know, vault core nodes is really about the availability of vault core, which goes back to the security of the system again. So, you know, you see like there's, there's, there's interesting about it and where, where you look at these things, how they fit in, but understanding that transition is a critical way of understanding how the technology fits in to solve a problem. Mm. Yeah. And, and, um, so, so, I mean, in terms of this, this kind of architecture, is, is this kind of quite new? It's not something that I'm familiar with. I, I've, cause I've had a, a, a life in software and it's not, not, uh, I'm not familiar with it. Is it quite common now or is it a kind of emerging? I would say it's, that's a great question. It's been around for at least I started, I've been doing it for 15 years. Now, maybe that was more of an exposure from the, you know, the, the defense and intelligence community of the United States. This yeah. is not some sort of classified secret thing. I mean, it's, you know, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. Right. Uh, it's a, but it's something they've looked at 
they've written. There's uh, some fantastic books on the subject. And I, I, what you, you might, what might be interesting is you probably will more likely to find it from a system of systems integration project. And, but it just is, it, but it, but it is something that just for even building a commercially available product, it's viable. I mean, because it helps you understand the scope of the problem you're trying to solve with your technology. Right. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to do some more reading on that. I think uh, if you've got any books you can recommend or uh, um, presentations, that would be great. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. Um, the, the other question I have around here is, is that, you know, um, we've mentioned AI and machine learning uh, and, and, you know, data. Is, it, is this something that uh, your company and yourself kind of uh, use? So background for me, I did a lot with data analytics in the past, you know, things you would call left of boom. Uh, you know, the idea that I predict something by looking at uh, applying a pattern to it to say, oh, this is where this, this, this manufacturing facility has to be. Right. Uh, taking it forward, the, you know, this idea you know, this this is this is this is a great place where some of the regulations and the security space absolutely are infuriating. <laughs> because to solve the, the the idea of looking, you know, figuring out, you know, whether it's a machine learning or a deep learning scenario and finding trends of cryptography that you could then use to manage and change things based off of use. Yeah. Is a great approach, right? It's a fantastic idea. It also gets into some very uh, interesting circumstances in terms of the exportability of that concept. Right. Okay. And that, 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 but in general, uh, when you think about it, if we just, let's, let's, let's take the, the Fornetic solution out of pocket for a second getting data getting patterns the right way to understand for any sort of system or network operation so that you can effectively optimize the network based off of you know patterns of usage is you know that i i see that being you know something you know where it is an absolute you know, it, it is a it is a good exercise. That is a good implementation of network operations or security operations to leverage your you know your artificial intelligence, your machine learning, to you know, to take the appropriate learning heuristic and apply it to that data so that you can actually then say, hey operator, do these things. Right. to optimize the behavior of the network. I don't think people are quite ready for the system to ultimately fix itself. Yeah. yeah. Because that, that, you know, that, that, you know, that things like Skynet come to mind, <laughs> <and> Terminator, <laughs> yes. but, yeah. but being able more like a, an Iron Man, a suit of armor, right. Where the, 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 the AI is working in partnership with the operator so that it, that, that, that it, that it's there when you need it to be. It, it has that ability to, you know, anticipate things, be anticipatory, uh, and, 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 and plan things out. So I, I would, I would tell you a lot of where I've been looking is how would I, for network operations, what does that look like? Yeah. How do I do that correctly? How do I, how do I determine trends in operation based off the data available? And then, you know, you know, effectively explain what the right courses of action are and not, and not, and not just for uh, fault scenarios, but, you know, arguably, if you think about things like, uh, you know, we have, there's a program here in the United States called uh, continuous uh, diagnostics and mitigation. Imagine what that would do in a CDM space, All right. uh, you know, to be able in terms of that transitioning from diagnostics to mitigation, having that AI ML piece would be able to say, hey, here's my best path to, to mitigate an event as it occurs. Maybe yeah. it's, you know, changing key material. Maybe it's triggering a configuration change on this piece of network equipment. Yes. Maybe it's 
disabling some user accounts. Maybe it's setting up other user accounts. I mean, there's a whole host of, you think about all the, 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 the catalog of functions that could be fitting in that space. And any number of them could be a, almost like a profile of what you would do as a course of action. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think AI and ML across the board is going to be critical is understanding what those things are, seeing the patterns and acting on it, not just, you know, in, 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 whether it's for operation or it is for, uh, or, or it's to help mitigate an event like, oh, this, this pattern does not look right. We've got a ransomware event going on. How do I blow the bridges yeah. so yeah. that I can prevent spread? Yes. And, and in terms of um, implementations, because uh, I, I, I did some AI a long time ago at University of Warwick um, and, you know, and coming back into this kind of space, uh, are, are these things actually being used? Are there kind of real use cases out there where this is happening or is it still kind of in the theoretical space? Uh, I would say that there is some example of it being used, uh, you know, and particularly in places that are, you know, where there's a high, there's, there's a large amount of, uh, you know, transactional type traffic. Mm. Uh, you know, you, the, the, I mean, look, there is evidence of a story of sort of the, 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 the algorithms, the learning that was from one of the trading houses here in the United States. Uh, when, when that was, was, when that was, uh, stolen, it was, you know, something arguably worth billions. Wow. And so the fact is that these things are being employed, uh, it's just the question becomes, are how well are they being employed in the security industry? Right. Uh, now, in some cases, we know that hey, uh, one of our, well, uh, the, the, the chief information security officer of BlackBerry Silence is on my board of directors. So I know, I mean, I know what like companies like Silence are doing. Right. Uh, and, but you know, that, that, and that's one, that's one piece. Uh, you know, you can hear things coming out of, you know, a lot of stuff from like a security operations center perspective. Uh, you know, so this is where that entire, you know, AI and ML, you know, are, are usually a sentence or two away when you talk about, you know, SOC and SOAR, you know, security operations and response. Uh, to see that though, seeing, you know, sort of, but from an orchestration perspective, I think that's still an area that people are realizing it would be necessary. Uh, I don't know how much thought, you know, is, uh, you know, from an industry perspective is being put into it. Right. I could tell you that I'm thinking a lot on the subject, but I cool. can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's an interesting area and uh, you hear lots of, lots of kind of, uh, uh, talk around it and, it and i'm kind of curious as to see uh you know when these things uh, actually uh, become real you know I, I can see the use but um yeah in, in fact we've, we've done some podcasts with uh, a number of uh, ai people as well so it might be worth uh, kind of sharing sharing those uh, oh i think it'd be that'd be a great reference for the listener to actually yeah. you know follow up on those i think you'll find that it, and this is an interesting this is another thing about being from the security industry uh you know, you, some of your customers might not, your people who are using those things internally might not want to broadcast it just yeah. like customers we have yeah. don't want to broadcast or using the technology because they're not trying to advertise anything about, you know, something that might be giving them a, a defensive or a competitive advantage. Yes, that's very true. That's a good point, actually. Didn't spot that one. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, this is great. I, and in terms of uh, your customers, you know, the kind of people you work with, how do you ensure that uh, the their experience of, of using your products is, is fits the bill and they're happy, happy uh, Larrys, you know? Oh, great question. And a lot of that speaks to a, I would say, uh, you know, a absolute dedication to making the customer successful and making sure the customer understands the why, right? And go back to that understanding the why, why do we do things? Why, why are we here? Uh, and you know what, and, and, and that, that, 
that would be something that why question is, well, why should I buy your product? You know, why, why are we making this change? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Uh, you know, I, th and so being there from a customer perspective, the way that we, you know, we, we treat things, you know, is that, you know, we're there to help during the implementation process. We're trusted advocates. Right. So we want to want to be people there, not just some guy who's selling you a box. We want to help you weave it in, integrate the technology in as part of what you're doing so that, you know, you're taking advantage of what you've spent money on. You know, you some budget aspect of budget was used to facilitate the purchase of our technology. We want to make we want to we want to make sure that you're getting the most out of it so that, you know, you continue to be successful. Yeah, that's great. That's, that sounds uh, very noble. And um, and I guess it's kind of speaking to, we were talking before the podcast around business agility, which is very customer centric. And it sounds like your organization is very much uh, aligned to you know those values and principles there. Um, I just kind of, um, I want to touch on uh, the, the thing that's in the space at the moment in terms of the, the COVID and, and uh, you know, teams working remotely. Um, how, how are you finding that? How, what tools are you using and how are you finding uh, leading your, your, your teams in this space? So a lot of Microsoft teams. So Microsoft <laughs> gets a massive product plug here. Uh, <laughs> lots, you know, I, I find that I do a lot of meetings with multiple tools. You know, we're using Zoom right now. Uh, and there was literally, this happened about a month and a half ago. I use in one day. I use Zoom, go to meeting, uh, uh, Teams, WebEx, and Google Meet, wow. all in one day. Wow, that's a that's a, you could play uh, conference call bingo with that, couldn't you? You know, you got got them all bingo. Um, but uh, yeah, so so and, and what what kind of challenges are kind of emerging from working remote? I mean, was working remote a thing that was the norm before, or is it kind of new for you? we had to adjust. I mean, a lot of, you know, certain things like getting in front of a whiteboard is a lot more difficult. Totally. Yes. I get you there. Uh, and, and you find that you have to, you really have to, you know, if you wanted a, a place where you learn when to do participatory and when to do delegating, this is the time because, you know, you have people working on different times, different schedules, uh, you know, because it's not just, it's, it's, it's not just a, you know, we're not just a U.S. organization. We, we, we have a, you know, we have offices in Paris, offices in Singapore, and we're supporting, you know, efforts globally. So it, a lot of it is how do you collaborate with people? You know, a lot of, you know, how, how, how do you get from point A to point B? And depending on what region of the world, the technologies might, you know, occasionally, you know, I'm, 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 I'm fielding questions via WhatsApp. Yes. And that, that, that's what people are comfortable with. So you, you find that you have to spend a lot of time uh, in this environment, you know, producing solutions that build comfort for customers so that when they're working in these environments. Additionally, you have to become, you have to yourself become comfortable with using technology to sort of cover down on what would normally be the intimacy of face-to-face -face communications. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm a very people person myself and that losing the whiteboard, I, I have this thing about whiteboards. So they're a great way of people's converging ideas and sharing and, you know, um, yeah. So I, I guess that's, uh, makes it quite difficult. Do, would you say that that collaborative work has uh, diminished or um, have you managed to kind of maintain its potency? I think we've, we, 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 I, it, it ebbed and it flowed, right? I found that I do a lot more scheduled brainstorming meetings now. Cool. Uh, primarily to ensure that you're maintaining open channels of communications. And maybe I don't, and you know, so that as things are going on, you're keeping track of them. Yeah. Because you, you know, you, now the challenge is, is that when you do that in a cross, if you're sort of a cross-functional role, your calendar ends up looking pretty insane looking on a regular basis, <laughs> uh, which I think, unfortunately, TC, you, you, you encountered with me firsthand trying to get this scheduled in the first place. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's that the, but that being said, it's that, you know, the trick is to communicate enough to answer the why and make that communication meaningful 
make it purposeful. Yeah. So that in it, you're not just, you know, you're not, you know, you're not just in a meeting to, you know, hear each other talk and be a self licking ice cream cone. <laughs> I, I would definitely say, I would definitely say something that's become critical for me. And I, and I really think is, this is such a little simple tech technique is if you're going to schedule a meeting, have an agenda. Yeah. Agendaless meetings right now are, you know, those are, those are things you got to be really worried about because you know, when you've so much of this is going on, if you don't have an agenda, you don't even know, wait for it, why you're in the meeting in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I totally, I'm totally aligned with you. It's a, it's something that it's a really small trick. Um, and it's really simple. Uh, it, some people might even say common sense, but it's, it's not always the case. And, um, I, I'm, I'm very aligned uh, with that with that suggestion there. Um, so, so t Chuck, in terms of time, we're kind of coming towards the end now. I, I wanted to kind of ask you, um, ask you. Uh, actually, I want to ask you this. I saw something on your uh, LinkedIn which I was very interested in. Is this save the world one idea at a time? That's a, that's a pretty powerful statement. Well, thank you. It's it's been sort of a a mantra of mine for for years and i've encouraged other people to I want people to think that way you know if you're going to make beneficial change if you're going to solve problems you've got to have to you know you just can't say that the world's a problem right you have to have an idea to solve it hmm. you know because you know that and, and, and that, that 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 that's a very i mean a more i guess another radical way to look at it is yeah great chuck i get the fact that yeah no one likes complaints they want to hear solutions but I also think that there's another piece of steadfastness in the process that if you have an idea and you believe in it, you know, you know, you, you, you're focused so that you are solving that problem. You're not, you know, because you, there, there's intentionality in that statement you know, saving the world one good idea at a time. Yeah. And it's not saying saving the world of every idea that I have when I'm walking down the road, bouncing off every idea in my head and I'm driving everybody nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you have an idea, it's a hypothesis, it's, an, it's a concept. How do I go prove it out? You know, how do I solve that? You know, and, 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 and if that does make life a little better for people, then you should try to think. I, I think that's a, I'm not just doing something. I mean, look, uh, ultimately you want to solve problems. You want to, you know, I want to do, you technology that the space we're in can save lives i mean you also have to i mean there's there's practicality is you have to increase shareholder value i mean look it's yeah. not a charity yeah i mean it's but 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 it's that first part it's the, the fact is is that you, you it's more than just you know a, a money-making scheme it, there has to be it's that saving the world you know is it, 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 you know it denotes a desire to do things that are purposeful that actually make a difference yeah yeah. And, and I think that's another, that, 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 that's something I think the military kind of you know, taking this conversation full circle, something the military truly imparts upon you is that driving desire, you know, that one, you know, you can make a difference, you know, you know, and particularly if you can be a team, you can make a big difference. Yes. And I think that, that, you know, that, that, that's another, you know, saving the world's a team sport. It's not a, you know, sort of Superman, you know, yes, there's uh, you know, right. you know, in, individuals can't do it on their own. Yeah. That's great. I love that. I'm, I'm going to take that forward. That's going to, that's going to go into my uh, uh, list of quotes. Um, uh, I, lo I love that. And, 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 and I think it's a reflection of yourself, uh, Chuck, you know, as to, as to put a statement like that out is a, uh, is a, uh, is uh, a, a nice sign of your character, you know, uh, and, and, and personal purpose. So um, in terms of uh, the gift that you'd like to kind of leave the uh, tech community leaders out there, what would be your kind of key takeaway that you'd like to leave them with in terms of your role and in, in, as a tech leader? That's a great question. <laughs> And, 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 and to consider that for a second, I, I would think understanding the impact of what happens when you can be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that a little differently here. Cause I'm, I'm thinking there, there's a, there's a phrase in systems engineering that says, you know, 
organizations build what they are. That's a, that's a fun one. That's, that's yeah, a good that's one. a good one. It's got me thinking. Uh, and if you're going to, and I'm a big believer in, in this idea of orchestration, whether it's cryptography, whether it's other things in the future, you know, this 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 ability to orchestrate. It needs to be considered that you know we don't build monolithic systems anymore. Hmm. Everything you know, for if I were to, you know look at to the broader world and say, what would I, what would be my piece of wisdom to give other tech leaders? Think not just, you know, think about those other attributes, not just what the system does. I would say in particular, how does it do it with other systems in mind? Mm. You know, it's, it's that, that, that understanding that, that the idea of interoperability is so critical because we we've come to a place that if we don't consider that we can't build secure systems, yeah. we can't build, we can't build functional systems and we will end up doing things that, you know, we, we won't ultimately meet the intent, whatever that might be. So I guess no technology exists in the vacuum. Think of act accordingly. How about that? That's the shorthand version of it. Cool. Excellent. That's great. It's been really good speaking to you, Chuck. Um, I, I've got a lot of uh, ideas and uh, thoughts here, and uh, I'm going to go away and uh, and read up on some of the technology that you've kind of described here because I'm kind of curious. But thank you for your time, sir. It's been brilliant. TC, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and have a great evening. You, sir. Okay. All right, take care. Well, there you have it. Another interesting journey of a person who arrived at the helm of an organization's technology department through an adventurous journey in the forces. Chuck's journey in the military and his injury led him to this space he holds now. It's interesting, isn't it? How dramatic events in one's life leads us to some interesting corners of life's possibilities. The key takeaways for me were as follows. Whatever happens in life, however bad, however good, use it, build on it and build from it rather than regret it. My second key takeaway is The Military Doctrine of Leadership. Check it out again in the podcast. I thought this was a very interesting area. And thirdly, my final takeaway is the importance of the why in organisations. We've all heard it from Simon Sinek. So take heed. It gets alignment and motivation for solving the organisation's challenges. So what were your takeaways? I invite you to share your thoughts. And remember to subscribe to CTO Confessions podcast and IT Labs newsletter, where you get regular tech articles and invites to IT Labs webinar series. URLs to do that can be found at the bottom of this page. We're consistently creating material to create, support and nurture a community of tech leaders. And of course, if you want to know more about IT Labs services, what we do and how we do it, please don't hesitate to get in touch. As mentioned in the intro, please think of us like tech leaders' favourite off-the-shelf service, providing quality, high-performing teams off that shelf with a wide breadth of skill and knowledge. Well, that's all, folks. Look after each other and keep safe. Wishing you all a good day and evening, wherever you are in the world, from all of us here at IT Labs. Live well and prosper. Until we meet again on the next CTO Confessions podcast. Cost.